It is now my honor to introduce our commencement speaker this evening. A tradition at TMI, the graduation speaker at TMI is chosen by a vote of the senior class. As such, it is a significant honor for one of our teachers, and this year's speaker has earned this distinction because of his inspiring teaching, his wit, his good nature, and of course his trademark white shirt and skinny black tie. <laughs> Mr. Matt Ridewood is himself a graduate of TMI, class of 2001. He went on to earn his BA at the University of Texas at Austin, and he has taught history, economics, and government at TMI for the past four years. He's the faculty sponsor of the Honor Council, he chairs our faculty committee on academic technology, as well as taking on many other duties. He's a valued colleague and a popular teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our 2014 commencement speaker, Mr. Matt Ridewood. Good evening, TMI. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, Bishop Lilybridge, Mr. Walker, our governors, trustees, faculty, students, parents, grandparents, friends, and congratulations to the class of 2014. It is humbling and heartening uh, to be given the chance to speak here tonight, and I'm truly honored. I graduated from TMI in 2001. I've been teaching here for the last four years. My father, Bob Ridewood, has been teaching here for 15 years. My wife, Carrie, has been the coach of TMI's cross-country and track teams for the last few seasons. My brother, John, is a 2004 alumnus. And my sister, Danielle, will be crossing this stage next year. Uh, my family is not just a big part of TMI, but uh, TMI is a really big part of my family. I'll start by flattering our graduates. This is a very impressive graduating class, among the most impressive I've seen since first coming to TMI as a student. I believe that graduating classes take on a collective personality. Sometimes this is for the better, sometimes not. Uh, but in the instance of this class, it's been so much for the better. I can't think of another class uh, pushing each other to succeed quite like this one. As a group, you are very high achieving. You have so much drive. And I cannot wait to hear about your future accomplishments. You've also been a very challenging class to teach very demanding, uh, certainly never content. <laughs> I've enjoyed teaching every one of you, and I've appreciated the challenge of doing so. Thank you for forcing me to bring it every class, day after day. Uh, teaching a group like you folks is precisely the reason I'm here. It's why I do what I do. In many ways, you've helped me grow as a teacher and as a person. Now. I want to take some time here tonight to address the parents of the class of uh, 2014 directly. Uh, my father has an amusing anecdote that he likes to share about me. Um, when we went up to Austin for the uh, move-in my first day of college, uh, we drove up with uh, my brother John. We met my uh, mother up there. Uh, Danielle was only four, so she stayed home. Uh, the traffic was, of course, horrendous in Austin. Uh, we found out that that was simply a prelude to a nightmarish parking situation uh, that we faced when actually arriving on campus. Quick side note. Uh, Bonies and Petruskeviches, um, just FYI, uh, the university makes no effort whatsoever to help avoid this disaster. Uh, it, is, it is really unnecessarily complicated. Um, on the other hand, you'll be amazed uh, by the efficiency of the game day operation for football. Anyway, we eventually managed to secure some temporary curb space and hastily choreographed a drop-off involving John as a lookout, Dad as the driver. Mom and I navigated the mass of people in the Jester East lobby to get my room key. Another quick side note. As a freshman, I lived in Jester East, a ginormous monstrosity named after former Texas Governor Buford H. Jester. It's, build uh, it's a building that's legendary for once having its own zip code. Class of 2014, your dorm will be nicer than mine, I promise. Jester looked like a prison, functioned like a prison, and smelled like a prison. <laughs> we met up, grabbed my stuff, headed back to Jester. 
After waiting 10 minutes to get to the front of the line of the elevators, we encountered uh, UT standout offensive lineman Mike Williams as he was getting out of the elevator. Those of you who do not follow UT football as closely as I do, uh, Mike was an offensive tackle who was drafted fourth overall in the 2002 NFL Draft. He holds the record for being the largest person to play professional football at six foot seven, weighing in at 375 pounds. My parents were also impressed. <laughs> well, perhaps impressed uh, isn't quite the word, actually. Um, you know, we thought UT was the place for uh, intellectual giants, not for, for actual giants. Mom's expression was some combination of shock and fear uh, because my new neighbor outweighed me by a two to one margin and I'm not a small person. Finally, we made it to my room. We were greeted by Steve-O, my new roommate, who, having already been in the room for hours, had set up his computer and miraculously deposited a layer of random garbage on his side of the room. And by garbage, I mean just this. It looked like he had literally taken a bag full of trash and opened it up in the dorm room. Again, this was a room in Jester East, meaning that I could almost touch both sides of the room at the same time. And my roommate decorated his half with garbage. Uh, just to clarify, that pile of trash never actually went away. Uh, Steve-O's version of uh, cleaning was to throw out his days-old pizza boxes. He was a very big fan of Mr. Gaddy's. Uh, and then he would sort of compress the existing trash pile so that it would stay on his side of the line. So I lived with Steve-O for an entire year. He was unique. By unique, I mean he was a particularly strange human being. As a junior, he was the only person I ever met who chose to live in Jester Prison dorm for three whole years. He was fond of wearing kimonos, but not making eye contact. He enjoyed studying, playing Counter-Strike, and solitude. He planned to become a lawyer. <laughs> so here we were, my parents, my brother and I, in a sterile, prisonish looking dorm room, and with my new roommate, who definitely gave off an axe murderer vibe. So my parents took me out to Target to pick up some stuff for my side of the room, and afterwards we went out uh, downtown for dinner. They took me back to campus, and by the time, uh, this time, hope, uh, things had calmed, so they helped me carry my new supplies up to my dorm room. Steve-O was thankfully gone, um, probably on his first run to Mr. Gaddy's. At this point, I thanked my parents for helping me move in and told them they had to leave because I had a date. And I was heading out in 15 minutes because she lived in a dorm on the other side of campus. Now, mind you, I was, I was quite pleased with all this. I was now officially in college. I was finally free of my parents and their curfews, and I had a date. This moment was very different from my parents. I didn't understand it then and was probably incapable of doing so at the time. Uh, three years later, my little brother John moved up to Austin to start his first year at UT. Uh, he's smarter than I am, so he got into a better dorm, picked a normalish roommate with low axe murdering potential. By then, I was a full-time Austin resident, living north of campus, and I'd stopped moving back to San Antonio a couple summers before. So I went down to help get uh, John moved in, and we did the same trip to Target, and followed by a nice dinner. Now, uh, John was and is a much more considerate person than me, so he handled the goodbye a little differently. He warned my parents ahead of time that he was going to hang out with a group of friends that night, so at the designated time, they knew it was time to go. Mom ended up giving me a ride uh, home before heading back to her, her hotel, and I got to see the other side of the, the big goodbye. She was devastated. It was very emotional for her. Uh, John had been her little baby, and now both of her children were grown up, living in another city. I knew that it was a big moment for John since I had experienced it just a few nights before, but I was really surprised that it was such a big moment for Mom. Parents, you will go from seeing your kids all the time to seeing them only once every few months. Right now, you pretty much know everything about them, what they do, where they go, who their friends are. But these things will all change. Your kids will change, too. And you'll have to hear about it by deciphering vague statements during a monthly phone call or perhaps a weekly one if you're lucky. And by lucky, I mean they'll be willing to exchange personal information because they've run out of money and need more from you. <laughs> they'll probably be back that first summer, but don't expect that to continue. 
your, your kids may not be quite as, uh, let's say, direct as I was, but your kids are going to tell you the same thing I told my parents, just in their own way. And you're going to have to let them go. Now, class of 2014, I'd like to speak directly to you. Throughout this year, I've shared all of my finding success in college wisdom with you, including the importance of daily exercise, getting up early on Sundays, and the various uh, civil liberties that you have protected by the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> so instead of talking about college itself, uh, tonight I want to talk to you about the time that comes after college. You may have heard of this. It's called real life or adulthood. Now, this is the point where all this education that you've undergone, all this preparation, finally comes to fruition. So I'll share a story about uh, my experience. When I was a sophomore in college, I took a part-time job as a clerk at an electronics store. Over the course of a couple years, I went from clerk, you've heard this story, <laughs> clerk to customer service manager, I uh, moved on to warehouse manager, and finally I was an operations manager for the entire store. So at age 22, I was managing a staff of 60 people in a store that took in about $12 million in annual revenue. And before this, I had never thought about pursuing a business career, but there was a certain thrill to being in such a competitive uh, sales environment, and the company compensated me very, very well, especially for my age. After four years, I had what is now popularly referred to as a quarter-life crisis. Uh, the thrill of competition wore off. I questioned what I was doing with my life. At 24, I was working 60 hours a week, selling bigger and better televisions to people who simply did not need them. It was no longer fulfilling, and frankly, I hated it. All I had at that point was a degree in government and four years of experience in a field I never wanted to return to. So, I called my parents, I told them I wanted out, and that I had no idea what I wanted to do. So they came to visit me in Austin, and help me put together a plan for the next stage. So my parents suggested I think about teaching. This, of course, had never entered my mind. Uh, nowadays, curious students often ask whether I was voted most likely to teach at TMI by my classmates. In fact, I am confident that if they held a vote for at least likely to teach at TMI, I would have won in a landslide. Uh, teaching was something my parents did. Uh, and in high school, I wanted something different. I, I, I really wanted to do anything other than teach. At this point, my mind was cautiously open to the idea. I was willing to try it. So my parents helped me put together a resume, and my mother told me to sign up for an independent school job fair in Dallas. I was looking for a position teaching high school history, preferably high school level. Unfortunately, there was little interest for a former TV salesman with no teaching experience whatsoever. But... But I ended up um, with a five-minute face-to-face with the assistant head of school at Greenhill, a guy named Tom Perryman. Uh, he told me up front that he was looking for teaching fellows. Uh, he described this, uh, these positions as one-year appointments for prospective teachers from non-traditional backgrounds like mine, providing on-the-job training that most teachers get when they're in college taking education courses. Now, here's the kicker. It was for teaching kindergarten. So I listened to his pitch and asked for some time to think it over. Um, of course, this meant calling my parents. They both thought it sounded great. In fact, <laughs> my mother was willing to let me do some substituting at, at her elementary school to get acclimated to teaching five-year-olds. So the next day, I called Mr. Perriman and asked for a formal interview. Things worked out. Teaching kindergarten was a terrific experience, and really genuinely life-changing. Uh, the next year, I ended up getting a position teaching high school history at another independent school in Dallas. But this job came without training wheels. I had no classroom materials, no curricular guidance, and they even gave me the wrong textbook for one of my classes. Yes, seriously. I planned the entire year around the wrong hi a world history textbook that covered a different time frame than the one the kids had. I discovered this on the first day of school after distributing the syllabus. I may or may not have cried. I taught three different subjects, coach upper school and middle school football, as well as varsity and JV basketball. It was insane. Uh, throughout the next couple of years, I was on the phone with my father, getting advice and support almost every single day. He helped me through the little stuff and the big stuff, and without him, I never would have survived. A 
I feel that you're getting this. I appreciate that. <laughs> Message received. Four years ago, uh, my father called me up. He uh, wanted to let me know that a teacher in the history department was retiring. Uh, TMI would have an opening for somebody to teach government. I knew this was a great opportunity, a chance to come back home after being away for 10 years. However, this was really not the best timing for me. I had a new girlfriend. Things were going very well. She just started working at my school in Dallas. And I was worried our relationship might not survive me moving to San Antonio. My mother had advice for me. She told me that if it's meant to be, you'll both make it work. As usual, she was right. If any of you happen to see my wife, Carrie, tonight, you will see that we are expecting our first this summer, baby girl. Our daughter's not even here yet, but I think I finally understand what it was like for my parents when they said goodbye to my brother and I when they left us at college. I think I get it now. At that moment, my relationship with my parents irrevocably changed. They knew it, I didn't. For 18 years, they'd fed me, taught me to walk, talk, swim, took me to acting class, coached me in basketball, made me do my homework, taught me to drive, put up with my shenanigans, and saw me walk across the stage when I graduated from TMI. And that was all over. This was the moment they let go. Class of 2014, I expect that you will have similar experiences. You'll push your parents away so that you can finally experience that freedom that you've earned. You really do need to spend the next five to 10 years of your life figuring it out, living your life, making the choices that will shape who you become. You'll learn how to be independent. You will learn from, your ex learn from experiencing tremendous highs, staggering lows, successes, and failures and it will be an amazing ride. At some point though, you will need your parents again. At some point on your journey into adulthood, you will need their advice, their comfort, and their wisdom. When you say goodbye on that first night of college next fall, they're gonna give you your space. They're not gonna call you all the time, right? <laughs> it's going to be on you to pick up the phone and call them. So here's my advice to you, class of 2014. Don't just call when you need money. Don't just call when you're having a tough time. Don't wait until you're in your mid-20s to figure out that things change after you say goodbye on that first night of college. A few months from now, you will no longer be children. And your parents will no longer be your parents in the same way that they are now. Your parents will be something closer to friends. Granted, they will be like your most judgmental friends. <laughs> but this is the price you pay for taking their money. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, they will be something like friends, caring for you and supporting you unconditionally. It will be on you to pick up that phone and share your lives with them. Calling for just a few minutes every couple of days is enough to build that new phase of the relationship. Tell them about your classes, both the good stuff and the bad stuff. Tell them about your friends, both the good and the bad. Tell them about your adventures, both the good and the bad. They like this. It helps them understand what you're going through, how you're changing, who you are becoming. They will learn to stop lecturing and learn to start listening, and it will be amazing. Good luck, class of 2014. God bless you.